second. at the moment too so Surgery PAs with Dr. Braxton. I just want to start by saying thank you for taking the time out of your evening to come learn a little bit more about what we love to do. Um, with that being said, I was asked to talk about my role as a neurosurgery PA and what I specifically can do for our patients. So I'd like to start by just saying that neurosurgery is so much more than the actual surgery. There is so much work and a lot of time and effort that needs to be done before and after the actual time in the operating. That's where a lot of my role comes in. I'm very involved in the pre and post-operative care, which just means that you're stuck with me from start to finish. So I'm here for you the whole time. Um, if you're starting your workup, you're gonna start by meeting with me in PA clinic for what we call a history and physical exam or an H&P. Uh, it starts off very simple. I'm just gonna listen. 
I want to hear your story. What are your symptoms? When did they start? How long have they been going on for? And of course, what have you tried? Have you tried PT, injections, Tylenol, Advil, Motrin Aleve? Did any of it work? All this information helps me start getting a list in my head about possible diagnosis that then we can start to treat. The second part is your physical exam. So you're gonna come see me in clinic and we're gonna do a lot of talking. We're also gonna do the physical exam where I test your gait, your balance, your strength, your sensation, your reflexes. Um, sometimes that exam is completely normal. I don't find a single abnormality. That doesn't mean you don't have true pathology going on. That piece of the puzzle is just as important as an exam that elicits a surprise symptom that a patient might not even realize they have such as a left tricep weakness or a numbness in the right L4 dermatome. Um, all these pieces, again, just keep those diagnosis lists growing so that we can figure out how we can help. So next up is imaging. I need to see what's going on in there. So I'm gonna start by ordering some x-rays. Let's check out those bones to start. The x-rays will show us bony pathology, um, arthritis, malalignment, any fractures. I review those with you in clinic and you actually see your pictures. I think it's important that you as the patient, see what your x-ray shows. I want you to leave that visit knowing exactly what's going on in that x-ray. It's the first step to knowing what's going on and also my recommendations that can help. Depending on your specific situation, I might recommend that we start with conservative treatment, whether it be PT or perhaps a referral to our physiatry team for an injection. That might be where we start. If you've tried conservative options and they haven't given you enough relief, or perhaps there's something that we've discovered that I think might prompt a surgical discussion sooner rather than later, then I'm ordering an MRI. That's the next step in the imaging workup and that uh, looks at our soft tissue pathology. Do you have a herniated disc that's compressing a nerve? Do you have an overgrown ligament that's compressing your spinal cord? Again, I'm showing you your pictures. You need to see your MRI. You need to know what it shows. That's important. Um, and with the surgical planning step, we combine the x-ray and the MRI, and we go from there. So we're all here to uh, see Dr. Braxton hear about his minimally invasive surgical techniques. So I will leave that part up to him. Uh, once surgery is decided upon, it's then my role to keep moving with the preoperative planning. So you and I are going to discuss what medications to stop before surgery, your anticoagulation, your blood thinning medications. Those are important. We have to talk about that. And usually we use the assistance of your primary care physician or a cardiologist, if you see one, to clear you for surgery and make sure you're the safest as possible. Um, we also talk about the need for a back brace or a neck brace if your surgery requires it. And we're also going to talk about preparing your home for surgery. We send you home with restrictions, no bending, lifting, twisting. So I always tell patients, if you need something that you're going to squat down to get or reach up high for, put it on counter height. It'll make things easier, and that way you can listen to our rules a little bit better. Uh, so ultimately, we talk about your post-op restrictions before surgery so that you have plenty of time to make ample arrangement. We're also going to have a very important discussion about post-operative pain management. Surgery hurts. That's going to happen, and we're going to treat you appropriately. But I want you to know ahead of time that the medications that I write for you are strong enough to hopefully take the edge off and keep you comfortable, but they're not strong enough to put you on the moon. I do not want you that loopy. I need you up, walking, functional. So it's important that we talk about that ahead of time so that we're all on the same page. The best part about post-op pain is it does go away. You just need to get you through. Uh, so with the preoperative phase complete, all of your questions and answers ready to rock and roll, the big day that we've all been waiting for is the surgery day. Uh, so you're going to see me in pre-op. I'm going to answer any last minute questions that you have. And we're, of course, going to sign your surgical consent form. That's the last piece of paperwork that essentially reminds us all what we're doing, what we're doing it for, and the, again, just a review of the risks of surgery before you sign it. Then we're ready to rock and roll. And before you know it, you're in the PACU area. You're in post-op, you're recovering, you've made it. Welcome to the post-op phase. I do have a little bit of a buzzkill that it is very boring to start. Um, we slow you down, you can be walking, you can do stairs, and I'm here to remind you that slow and steady wins the race. I will tell you multiple times if need be, I promise that we all know that you live in a very active community, we wanna get you back out there, but we have to do it safely. So if we you know, tell you our post-op restrictions, we have them for a reason, and if you can adhere to them, you're gonna get back to the activities you wanna do, no problem. So that's kind of my bullet point list of uh, what I can do for you as a neurosurgery PA. 
Ultimately, my role is to be your support system from start to finish, from the beginning of the care through graduating you um, and hopefully having great success along the way. Um, you know, our patients might be new to neurosurgery, but we do this every day. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, there's no concern or question that's too small. Um, we're at the other end of a clinic visit, a phone call or an email. So I like to think we're pretty accessible and we've got a great team here. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. And uh, can we get a round of applause for our first in-person event? We've got a crowd here. It's a full house. We have over 200 people online. So that is uh, really, really exciting to me. Um, I'm just going to talk about minimally invasive surgery. What, is that, what does that mean? Is it just a you know buzzword? Or does it really mean a fast recovery? And I'll talk about a little bit some of the things that we do here. I will say that your diagnosis in the clinic determines your success. The surgeries, we do thousands of these surgeries, and it's by now it's almost muscle memory. So doing the right operation for the right patient really determines the success of the operation. And uh, before I get too far along, I do want to thank uh, Boston Scientific uh, for sponsoring this event, as well as Vail Summit Orthopedics and Neurosurgery. Um, Rachel put in a lot of work as well as Leslie, Lori, and thanks uh, to Laura for giving her talk. I really appreciate that. So minimally invasive surgery is an interesting, it's not a procedure. It's not one procedure is minimally invasive. It's more of a philosophy. The philosophy is less but better, okay? Um, so we're gonna try to do less surgery, but hopefully do enough surgery to get you uh, functional, functional and better. So a couple of ground rules for the uh, event. Uh, for, this is for the folks online, not for the in-person folks, but we want folks to stay muted. If you have a question, you can use the chat option and we'll, we're monitoring that and we'll answer those questions. And also for everybody who's live and in person, stop me, interrupt me, ask me questions, and we'll make this as interactive as possible. And um, for a lot of different reasons, mostly for privacy and HIPAA rules, I cannot go into somebody's individual problem. Like don't start taking off your shirt and showing me something that's going on there. Like make an appointment and we'll, we'll go in depth on personal specific problems, okay? But you can say, I have a friend who has this problem and we'll talk about it, but not you personally. So we're gonna talk a little bit about one minimally invasive surgery. It's a surgery that's not commonly done. A lot of people have never heard of it called spinal cord stimulation. It's a, um, non-narcotic way of treating chronic pain. So if, you, if you've seen doctors and doctors and said, there's nothing we can do, and you're just on chronic drugs, and this is a way to, to give you pain relief without using narcotics. We're gonna talk about something that I'm really kind of proud of, of starting the first awake spine surgery uh, program in Colorado, definitely up in the mountains. Um, some folks that have been through it, you don't need to be under general anesthesia. We do make you comfortable enough that you don't remember much of the surgery, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about motion preservation surgery. Sometimes you need to fuse the spine, but uh, in many cases we can preserve motion with new technology that allows you to keep the spine moving, being active and healthy. Um, and we'll talk about who's a candidate for that and then learn about referral options uh, for our patients. So spinal cord stimulation, first, first topic. Uh, these are symptoms that occur without a trigger, like nothing happened. I just got up and I'm in pain. Or I, I didn't do a lot of trauma. I didn't get, I wasn't playing flag football with the grandkids this weekend. Um, I'm in pain. A uh, pain that usually lasts for more than three to six months is a candidate for spinal cord stimulation. There could be weakness, numbness, or pins and needles, uh, shooting or stabbing, burning pain, okay? Um, usually, People with chronic pain, they start having problems. And this is whole cascade. They become the grump in the house. They're not able to perform basic tasks, doing laundry, cleaning up around the house, not able to be to work or be productive, playing with children or grandchildren, um, working outdoors, gardening, and also being just being, you know, sexually active. So chronic pain can stop you from really getting the full benefit out of life. Um, we always try conservative measures, and you may have already tried these, you know, pain medications, uh, physical therapy, a TENS unit, 
uh, opioids, drug pumps, spine, uh, even had previous surgeries that didn't work. This is something we might want to talk about. So spinal cord simulation. So this is something that's a little bit different. I think the cardiologists are a little bit ahead of, a, ahead of us, but they implant pacemakers to help run the heart. And this is a pacemaker for the spinal cord. It's about the same size as a pacemaker. It's a medical device designed to reduce pain. Pain is a personal experience, okay? We all perceive pain a little bit differently. Um, and that's, that's true. So we need to do a trial. And the only person that really knows if, if a stimulator device is the right choice is really the patient, okay? But it's for somebody who's had neuropathic pain, pain that's from nerves, not, not mechanical pain, not from you know a dog bite or arthritis, but it's for pain from, ner from nerve pain, like a toothache in your leg, a toothache in your back. Um, somebody that's tried, tried to have surgery and it didn't work. Not all surgeries are successful. I like to think a lot of mine are, but not all of them are successful. We think about a, a stimulator device, pain in the back or legs. This is what it's approved for, back and leg pain right now. So there are uh, devices that have been around. A lot of people haven't heard about them, but it's been around for 40 years. But if, does anybody know the first time somebody's ever used uh, neuromodulation for pain? And, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's a lot longer than you think. The ancient Egyptians used electric fish Electric catfish, they got out of the Nile River for arthritic pain. They saw that that electricity can help with pain. And we all run on electricity. I don't know if you know anybody who's had a, a brain stimulator for Parkinson's disease or a pacemaker to help run the heart. We can also do a pacemaker for pain, which is something that a lot of people don't know about. It's not experimental. It's FDA approved. There's a lot of solid evidence. And we'll go we'll talk a little bit about the, the evidence behind it. It's a non-drug therapy. It runs on electricity. It doesn't involve taking pills, narcotics especially. Um, and it may result in uh, improvement in function and reduce and, and less dependence on, on pain medications, okay? So there's, there's two ways to really uh, experience spinal cord stimulation. Some people experience what we call paresthesias in the medical world. My patients call it champagne bubbles. You feel like bubbling or tingling around the area of your pain and it helps distract you from the pain. You don't have to be a neurosurgeon to know that if you hit your thumb with a hammer, it feels better when you rub it. That rubbing feeling helps block or distract some of the pain uh, perception in your brain. And pain doesn't really become pain until it hits your brain and processes it. We block those sensations before they're they become a part of your consciousness, a part of your daily life, a part of something that can really alter the way you interact socially with your, with your, with your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children or grandchildren, okay? So we do a trial, and this is the only operation that I do that I know of that it's a try before you buy situation, okay? So we, we put in the leads and we see if it works, okay? If I knew it was gonna work before I did the surgery, I would just do the surgery, but pain is an experience and about 90% of patients that we trial go on to have implants. 10% of patients the trial didn't work, we try to find something else, okay? Um, the minimum standard, the minimal clinical um, benefit that I would, I would proceed with the trial is 50% relief, but most patients hopefully are getting 80 to 90% relief. Occasionally we hit a home run and there's no pain, but that's rare. But I would expect to get, try to get 80% relief. The minimum, the minimum benefit is about 50% relief. We see, is your sleep improved? Do you have increased functionality? Are you reaching for your pain medications less often? And sometimes that pain medication for people that self-medicate might be a finger of scotch or two fingers of scotch. Are you doing less of that be more interactive, more aware of what's going on around you. Okay, that's what life is. Um, so um, the paresthesia that I talk about, that's one aspect of it. But once we know that the device is covering your pain area, we can turn off the champagne bubbles. We can do what's called sub-perception therapy or paresthesia-free therapy. And, or we can do a combination. I had a patient who was literally disabled. She came to my office as a young woman in her 20s, um, got into a cheerleading accident, and then 
hurt it again with a soccer accident. She had been to all the, you know, all the, the best doctors in Boston. And I, I think those are a lot of great doctors at the Harvard program. And they said, there's nothing that can be done. And so she came to see us. I tweet, uh, my PA, Holly, who's another, another one of my PAs, tried to do an examination and it put her in tears. And these examinations are not rough. It's not like a, a rigorous obstacle course. In tears, just to be examined. And so we put a stimulator in and she got 80 to 90% relief and she has different programs. She's got a program for sleep, a program for work. She's working now and a program for snowboarding. So there's different levels that you can control your pain with and it's all with a remote control. Um, she actually ended up getting married and moving away. She was actually a big loss to our community. She worked in our surgery center, but she is one of one of the patients that really made me a big believer in why I do this, why I got out of bed, why I see patients, is to really change somebody's life. And she's got a long, a lot of years ahead of her. And the stimulator was a big a game changer for her. Okay, so this is the evidence. So um, showing an interval improvement in pain. So just to, to get to get an idea, what does this mean? So a pain score of 10 is the worst pain you can ever imagine. The worst physical pain you can ever imagine. And a one is not so bad. So we're able in aggregate to take pain from an eight, eight and a half to like a two or a three. And most folks are happy. It's like, I was living at an eight, I'm at a three. Thank you very much. Occasionally we get the home runs. Sometimes it doesn't work, but for the most, for most of my patients, 90% of my patients, get this type of relief from, from a spinal cord stimulator. And this is studied time and time again for over 40 years as being an effective pain relief. Okay, so that's spinal cord stimulation in a nutshell. Not everybody's a candidate. It's usually kind of a tool that I have to address the problem. But if I can address the, the problem head on, I'll do that, okay? So we'll talk about awake spine surgery. So this is really spine surgery, but less invasive, so, less invasive that you don't have to go to sleep. You don't have to be on a ventilator or a breathing machine. You don't have to stay in the hospital overnight. And what I, I think it does is that we do the same operation that you would do if you were all the way asleep, but we try to avoid all the muscle dissection, all the tissue, tissue disruption that causes a lot of the post-operative pain, okay? So uh, what this allows is for a fast recovery. We're, getting, we're doing the same operation. If you wanna go to sleep for surgery, that's also possible. We can do that. I try to talk you out of it, but if you want to be asleep, we can. Oftentimes when people are asleep, they don't even remember the surgery. And I'm not going to call anybody out, but I've, I've seen patients in the rooms who are awake during the surgery and they don't remember a thing. Okay. So it's more regional anesthesia than it is totally asleep. You're comfortable doing the surgery. It's not like we give you a stick to bite on while I'm doing the operation. We're actually making it much less invasive. Okay. And so um, this next guy was a uh, patient of mine was really, really uh, grateful. He's a pastor in the community and he, he, he volunteered to let us film his experience with awake surgery. So I'll just tell him what, uh, this next video shows you what he was like before surgery, gets you, lets you get to know him. And so I'm really grateful to Mr. Rossman who let me uh, film his surgery and tell his story. Oh, we don't have sound. So um, he was a, a really active athlete in his youth and developed spinal stenosis. He also had some instability in his, in his back and it started limiting his ability to uh, uh, talk to his parishioners, to interact with folks. He had to get a cane. This, this is a young man and he's walking with a cane and he experiences this electrical shock, a toothache that goes back into his legs. And so he came to see me and we talked a little bit about what treatment options. I'm going to come back to his story in a little bit, but I'm going to talk about what he had. So he had something called spinal stenosis. That's a process that happens with aging. Uh, um, there are three guarantees in life, death, death and taxes, and also spinal stenosis. If you live long enough, you're going to get arthritic, uh, arthritic disease, and it's going to put pressure on your nerves. Most people don't pain with walking and standing. And they know that it's better when they sit down or lean over a shopping cart sometimes. And that, that disease process is really easily treated. Here are two patients who had a similar problem that is, you know, after surgery. So just two hours after surgery, 
You know, this woman is in her 70s. I'll talk a little bit about those, those wires coming in her back. Those are pain blocks to help with the pain medication. And they, don't, they, they go home with you, but they only last for about two or three days, sometimes four days. They give you non-narcotic pain medication to get you over that initial hump of surgery. Okay, so this is her. This is another guy four hours after surgery. I don't know why my female patient got better faster, you know, walking like that. But the, the guy took a little bit longer to get up. But this is what you see after in a weight surgery. Both these patients went home the same day. They slept in their own bed. You know, that's very different than how I learned how to do spine surgery. But I can tell you a little bit on a personal note. I never wanted to go into spine surgery. I actually hated it when I was training in Pittsburgh because people were in the hospital for days and days, we gave them bottles and bottles of narcotics and they didn't really seem to get better. And so I wanted to go more into cranial surgery. And that's what I did in the military for the most part was cranial surgery. And then I started learning more mentally invasive techniques and I made a total pivot. I told my wife one day she's here, I'm so glad she's here. You know, and I said, you know, why don't we move to Vail and, and Summit County and take care of people and I'm gonna stop doing brain surgery and I'm gonna switch to mentally invasive surgery. And, and then this is what it's kind of come out about. So, lumbar spinal stenosis is narrowing around the nerve roots. It's a, it's a degenerative process that if you live long enough, you're probably going to get it. You're going to get gray hair, pay your taxes, and get spinal stenosis. And there are treatments for it. And one of the treatments I do is a minimally invasive outpatient decompression surgery. So, the spine looks like really narrow. And that's what I'm trying to show that. So, I look at a lot of MRIs every day. But I'm trying to show you that the area around the nerves is narrowed before surgery. Then after the surgery, the nerves have just a little bit more room, just a few more millimeters is all it takes to relieve this problem. It's a small incision, very low of risk of infection. Knock on wood, we had no infections since I moved up to bail. So I mean, I know I'm gonna get a, an infection one day, but not, not today. And a very low risk of reoperation, okay? But awake surgery does require a little bit of a change in how you approach the patient, okay? This is the time to have a patient-centered operating room. You know that I'm doing my surgery. My, I have my PAs, Laura and Holly, that assist me with the operation. But the key and critical parts I'm doing, and, you, and I'm talking you through it, okay? I can examine you during the operation. We avoid the risk of general anesthesia, which is safe, but does have risks. Um, and it, it encourages me to be more gentle with what I'm doing during the surgery. Okay. Imagine if you took your car into the mechanic and he fixed it, but didn't turn it on until you brought it home. Okay. I can test you in the operating room to know that, that we fixed the problem so that we don't go home and say, oh, I still have pain. Okay, let's come back and do another surgery. So that's a really great, great, um, great part about a minimally invasive, uh, minimally invasive <laughs> awake surgery. So this last, so this operation, this is Michael. We're coming back to him. Um, uh, the operation took about an hour and 12 minutes. We did this last uh, December. And uh, this is what he looks like right after the surgery. So um, he's awake. He, he doesn't have a breathing tube in, but we did the operation. Um, we tried to get his spine fixed. This is me blabbing about how great he's going to do. And he really is. This is his wife after surgery. He asked for pizza. So we gave him a pizza after after the operation. Um, uh, I'm talking to him after the surgery. This is just right after he came out of the operating room. I'm asking him if his pain got better. Um, you can't really hear that, but he had a lot of leg pain. You saw the video beforehand. The leg pain is now gone. Thank goodness. And um, he can move his legs. Everything's working. Okay. And then I have him walk, exercise after surgery. This is right after surgery. We had him get dressed and went home the same day after the operation. So after surgery, so this is what, what I was dealing with, Michael. And I know you guys aren't radiologists, but this is one of the tests that Laura or, Laura or Holly will order is an x-ray. And we just, just looking at the x-ray, your eye goes down to one area here. And I don't know if you can, you can see that the bone here is in alignment and it's out of alignment and it's we're pinching in this nerve right there. I was like, I, I, I can fix that. I can do something about that. And you don't have to have um, a prolonged hospital stay. You don't have to go to sleep. You can do this outpatient. Don't want to get out of my life. So the way I fixed it was I reconstructed the spine. I realigned his bones. 
Yes, we do have to put screws in and realize, oh, that's a stabilization operation. Yes, this is the F word. This is a fusion operation. Um, fusions have been kind of really probably overdone in the United States as opposed to other countries. It may be done for the wrong reasons, but for the right reasons, I think it can be very helpful in the right patient. Um, I, I checked his alignment parameters and it was all within normal limits. And I was like, Michael, you're good to go. Okay, so let's see how you do before and after surgery. So you remember he was walking with a cane before the operation. So before the operation, he walks with a cane. The surgery was the bruising of the cane on the walker. Now, you know, and now he's, he's walking without it. I think he's, he's gotten fitter. I wish he could hear his own words because I can't really do it justice. He's lost weight, he's exercised more. He's back to being a pastor. Um, Doing, doing what pastors do is not just breaching and moving chairs around, you know, helping out. And um, he's really got on with his life. I, I feel really blessed that I could be a part of that. Okay. So that's awake surgery in a nutshell. Next surgery, I, haven't, I don't do those awake. I still do those asleep. The reason why we have to do those awake is we have to move over your windpipe during the surgery. And if I did that with you awake, you'd feel like I was choking you. And I, I don't think that, so I don't, so I do those all the way asleep, okay? So with neck surgery, we can do most preservation operations. So this is not for, you know, I was playing football and my neck hurts, my shoulder. It's for pain that lasts more than six weeks. And for somebody that's had pain, that has tried something else, physical therapy, injection, something else, and it's still not getting better, okay? And so we consider them for arthroplasty. And it's usually between age 18, skeletally mature folks, and 67. But not everybody's a candidate. If you have bad osteoporosis, you may not be a candidate. If you have a tumor or a fracture, you may not be a candidate. But this is a way to preserve motion in the most mobile part of our spine, the neck, okay? So let's talk about what happens as you get older. As you get older, what happens is your discs degenerate. They're like the tires on your car, okay? You can't expect your tires to last the entire time in your car. The more you use it, the more it wears down, okay? You can get disc herniations, you get a pinched nerve. What we do, as opposed to the way I used to take care of this problem, which is a fusion, and I still do fusions for some people that need it, okay? I'm not saying a fusion is a bad operation. I try to pre preserve the motion, okay? And so this is a, a kind of a, an animation that shows you the difference between motion and uh, motion preservation. And you can still move your neck with a fusion, Okay, Peyton Manning had a fusion. He can still move his neck. He won a Super Bowl, but with a good defense, he won a Super Bowl. You know, and you can you can see that there's increased motion, and what that does is it helps preserve the levels above and below your fusion. It's like the the, the cars on the train track. If you fuse cars together, that will help, but it puts more wear and tear on the other cars as it goes around hills, up and down hills. It puts more stress on the levels of above and below. So. We have an x-ray of somebody who's had a, 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 a fusion, uh, I guess not a fusion, a motion preservation operation. And um, because of privacy rules, I'm not gonna call her out by name about the person that had, an, had, had this, but this is a person who had compression on her spinal cord. She was having neck pain, headaches. And when I examined her, she was having um, signs of like impending weakness from her spinal cord. So instead of fusing her, we put in these artificial discs and, and preserve her motion. So um, is this a, uh, an experimental treatment? No, it's not. It's been around for over 10 years. I've been doing it for about 10 years or so. And we know that uh, comparing it to fusion, we've seen fewer re-operations. So 5.3% um, for artificial discs, compared to 40% for a fusion at the inferior level, well, about 11% of a reoperation. It's not zero. It's still, there's a risk of reoperation for artificial discs at the level above, and 26% for, for a fusion. So we notice faster return to work, fewer narcotics, and um, the, the, the rate of, of complications was far less with the artificial discs when we compared to what we fused the spine. Sure. So that's a really good. So the healthy cervical spine moves about eight to twelve degrees per level below CT. 
So 8 to 12 degrees of how much motion is in a healthy spine. Now, I say that, but most of my patients have already lost that by the time they show up. They might have two or three degrees or four or five degrees. But in a normal spine, what we've what we examined, there's about 8 to 12 degrees. And these, these artificial implants, there's different ones on the market. I'm not supporting one or the other. I have different indications for whatever device I use. Really restore motion about 8 to 12 degrees. Okay? And... That's a, that's a fair amount. I mean, if you think about how much your spirit, if your head moves, nobody's head moves unless it's Halloween and the exorcist 360 degrees. It moves about 110 degrees from left to right. And that's what you need to have a driver's license. You have to show that you can move your head 110 degrees to check your mirrors, okay? And each segment does its job and contributes, contributes about eight to 12 degrees to that. So we fuse that area. You still move your head, but it's a little bit less. So you might have to start moving your, your shoulders too look around so but in truth as you get older that flexibility decreases I, I i i don't think there's a person in this room that that doesn't realize that you're not as flexible as you were when you're you know in grade school and you lose flexibility but in a normal spine eight to 12 degrees you lose that spine in the end stage disease it doesn't move as much but maybe about you know four or five degrees so i'm gonna keep going about lumbar artificial disc go ahead <laughs> so I, that, that actually was her x-ray i wasn't gonna say it um, no, my hand, I have to do it. It's my hands, I was dropping things, and I was getting, you know, getting my blood. All my reflexes were off, and they were only at worse. And so, I just went up like this. And I didn't even have any cramping, I didn't have any headaches. I just, I was really in the Yeah. I mean, it was great. It was. So that scar will flatten out, yeah. So, well, th thanks, thank you so much. I that was very brave of you to, to, to speak up. That was her actually, by the way, and I wasn't gonna call her out that, you know, I did surgery on her uh, a little while ago. Um, uh, this is very controversial, but I have a new therapy for neck scars. Um, this is not FDA approved, but I find that if you put diamonds on the scar, the bigger, the better, it bothers you less. I don't know why, I don't know why, okay. So still working on the insurance company to pay for the diamonds. Okay. So if chronic pain denies you from doing these act activities, being active, not being a grump, you know, chores around the house, working, playing with your children, then we can think about, you know, uh, uh, spinal cord th simulation. But before we think about that, we can also put artificial discs in the lumbar spine, and that's for back pain and low back. And the same, re the reason. The justification is the same as in the neck. Now, the lumbar spine moves a lot less. It moves about four or five degrees in each segment in the lumbar spine, not as much as the neck. Most of the movement actually comes from your hips, and my partner does those. I, I, I don't do windows, and I don't do hips, so don't call me about hips. But um, we see that there's decreased reoperation, decreased adjacent segment disease with artificial discs. The artificial discs are in that light blue number. And in the, in the fusion number, it's, it's a higher number. Now, some folks need, like that first guy, he needed a fusion. He was a candidate for an artificial disc. But we find artificial discs in some patients can be helpful. And that's an update and what we're doing, how we're trying to make the thing better. So, yeah. They go in through the front. I'll, I'll talk about the risk profile. Risk profile is higher for lumbar, okay? And... I don't do that by myself. I have a, a partner that helps me with those access and we're, we're getting to that. You'll, you'll see that in a bit. If your question's not answered, I'll, 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 get, I'll, have, I'll actually hit you up again. What's your name, sir? Bill. Okay, okay, Bill. Okay, Bill. Bill. I, I, I don't recognize anybody with a mask on. That's the biggest problem. Like I'll see patients, I was like, who are you again? I don't see, I don't recognize you. So, so I studied this, I wrote a paper on it. We saw that, um, the, the return to, to, to work was was uh, about six weeks for physical work, for a sedentary work, like an account. One to two weeks, you get back to work, okay? 
work involving heavy lifting. So if you're, you know, really doing a lot of lifting, I, I keep you out of work for a little bit longer, up to three months. We, uh, we also, I also wrote a paper on the seven year outcomes from artificial disc. And we noted the main highlights, decrease narcotic uses, improve function, decrease pain, and reduce adjacent segment disease. That's like fusing a spine and the level above it breaks down. And 86% of the patients in this study, there are over 300 patients in the study, return to work full time. Yeah. So artificial disc surgery does not help with numbness. Let me tell you a little bit uh, something about numbness, okay? So numbness implies that if you have numbness, you already have nerve damage. That's a damage to either the covering of the nerve or the inside of the nerve called the axon, and that's, that's nerve damage. And the artificial disc helps primarily with pain, not with numbness, okay? And so what I can do is try to create conditions for it to heal, but at this point, I'm not able to repair the nerve and restore the numbness. It hopefully will heal on its own, but it does not always, okay? If your arm is stuck in a door and it starts, at first it hurts, right? Your arm's stuck in the door, then it gets weak, and then it starts to get numb, okay? That's nerve damage. If I open the door, thanks doc, it doesn't hurt as much, but it's still numb. It's still gonna be numb because that's damage that's been done to your nerve. And that's why I urge people, if they start having numbness with these problems, to really get medical attention. It doesn't have to be me, although I'm happy to see anybody that want, you know wants to see me, but if you start having numbness, you're having nerve damage, okay? This is a, another slide that looked at the, the long-term recovery from pain after seven years. And we see that the pain starts at like an eight or nine up here. It gets better after about three months, six weeks and three months, it gets a lot better. Then it, stay, it gets better and it stays better. And this is seven years, okay? Wait for the 10 year paper. In three more years, we'll do the 10 year paper, okay? But at seven years, this is what we know, um, the, pain, the pain relief is durable. Pain doesn't go to zero, this is zero. Pain never goes to zero, but it goes to, you know, a two or a three from a, you know, a seven or an eight after seven years. Um, I, do we think at, you know, year 10 is going to come up here? I don't think so. I think it's going to stay low, but, um, this is a scientific paper. We got to see what the data shows. I don't think it's going to get worse after seven years. So, um, this is one of my, uh, uh, patients that I did when I first got up here. This is a, uh, patient that had an artificial disc. She was told by two other surgeons that you need to get a fusion. And a young patient, especially patients are going to live a long time, more than seven years, I hope, you know? Why don't we try an artificial disc, you know? And this is this is her story. So uh, now I am back to coaching. I am an owner across the Down Valley, but I am yes, in classes before surgery. I was really Delicious. struggling with getting through a class. So now I am coaching with ease. I can get through a class and demonstrate anything for people. So I hope others can learn from my experience that having back problems or having back surgery doesn't have to impact your quality of life and I hope that people will learn that you can get your life back and not to shy away from talking to Dr. Braxton and getting a consultation. So artificial disc surgeries are great for younger folks, older folks. Sometimes I do still do the fusions. I try to make them awaken out patients, but this is her two years after her surgery and I'll check in with her at seven, 10 years and we'll come back for another talk. Okay. But she's still great. So Okay, different risk profile from going into the front. The spine's in the middle of the body, and to get there, we have to move the abdominal contents, the, the bowel, the ureter, and move the blood vessels around. I did this on my own in the military, you know, when I had to, but now that I'm in, you know, veil, I prefer to do a team approach and have two surgeons, you know, do this operation. A surgeon that just does this full time, he's actually... A friend of mine, we actually served together in Afghanistan at the same time. I never met him. He was in another combat out area. But, you know, he he kind of gets it. And that's why I go to him for um, for these approaches. Okay. And this could be for a fusion or artificial disc. But not everybody's a candidate. So if you have a lot of advanced vas you know, vascular disease, it's a bad idea. You should go from the back. If you have a lot of abdominal surgery, bad idea. Go from the back, which is another option but generally good health, but we cannot put the artificial disc in from the back. It's too big, it's too large. So the exposure is performed 
um, by going through the front. And I'll just narrate this a little bit. He puts it the, he couldn't be here today, but he put together this really great animation. We start by kind of figuring out what level we're gonna operate on uh, and putting a marker on the skin, we get an X-ray. Let's see what the marker is. Um, we we uh, prep and drape the patient, like we always do to reduce infections. And this is a surgery that's done asleep. We don't do this awake. This is not brave heart. Okay. okay, we still do this. The back surgeries I can do awake, but the, the, the front surgeries, if you're coughing, it, it messes everything up. So I cannot have you awake during this operation. Okay, but um, the approach is a muscle splitting approach. We don't cut any muscles during the operation. We use a device to kind of open things up. That device actually is called the Bovi Cautery, which is invented by a neurosurgeon who's done to push uh, back in the 1930s, we still use it today. Um, and we put in retractors to kind of hold things apart. So then the, the abdominal contents rests in a sac called the peritoneal sac. And we have to mobilize that and move that over. And usually either Lori or Holly is helping, helping during this part of the operation. I'm not usually always in the room during this part of the surgery. I'm actually seeing other patients who do other things or are attending other things. But my partner, Dr. Chef, who couldn't be here today, is uh, going to help with the exposure. So this exposure, it looks like it's really slow, but it really takes about 10 minutes for L5S1. It takes about 15, 20 minutes for L45, depending on the patient. Dr. Chef put in a really long video, so and there's no the sound isn't coming through, so I'll have to narrate. So once we find the vessels, we try to isolate them. We sometimes tie off um, critical vessels, and we um, buzz any any um, any smaller vessels that can be taken during the surgery. I'm gonna try to fast forward this. That was a bad idea. So anyways, the access surgeon will continue to expose the spine and get me to where I need to be. And then once the spine is exposed, I, I assume the role as primary surgeon and I do the reconstruction, whether that's an artificial disc or sometimes a fusion from the front. All right, so the risk of anterior surgery is a bleeding risk, which is, which is different than going from posterior, but it's small injury to, um, uh, things that were, are going to come in our path, like bowel, ureter, abdominal organ, it's very small, less than 1%. In males, folks, so th this does not affect your ability to have um, intercourse, but it does affect your ability to procreate very rarely, less than 1% in males. So it's something that we need to talk about. I don't recommend that folks bank sperm. We used to talk about that in the past. There's other ways to procreate um, after, the, after this type of surgery if you're in that unlucky group that's less than 1%. So we talked a little bit about spinal cord stimulation, awake spine surgery, uh, motion preservation devices. Um, one of my patients was really nice enough to, to, to say that she actually had the surgery. I, showed her, I had her x-rays up there. Um, and also uh, artificial discs in the lumbar spine. And that's really an update on how we're trying to make spine better. Medicine is a very conservative uh, practice. We don't try to do radical things, you know. I'm all ears about turmeric and how it can help you, but uh, our our advances are incremental and slow. But I do think we're making progress. And spine surgery is not what it was ten years ago. Um, that's all I have in the formal presentation. Do we have any uh, questions? Yeah, sure. So. So it depends. It de the answer depends. So spinal cord stimulation does not, osteoporosis, osteoporosis is not an issue. For artificial disc, we measure how much osteoporosis you have. And I might ask you to measure it with a, um, a test called a DEXA scan. The DEXA scan gives us an idea of how brittle or how soft your bones are. Osteoporosis is a measure of softer bones. And everybody in this room, after the age of 30, your bones get softer. That's just the way it is, okay? Um, 
Your bones get softer and more osteoporotic after the age of 30. Your best bone density is at age 30. So if you're under age 30, congratulations, you have the best bone density, but it gets worse, okay? But that's part of the privilege of getting older. So for an artificial disc, the T-score needs to be less than, than 1.5 for an artificial disc. For a fusion, it needs to be less than 2.5. Than 2 if it's greater than 2.5, I don't say goodbye, good luck. I tried, there are therapies to increase your bone density, mostly hormonal therapies, anabolic therapies to increase it. I might say, you're not a candidate right now. Come back in three months after we've done this therapy and we'll try to do our um, therapy to increase your bone density. So that, 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 that's all, that's what I have to say about our um, osteoporosis. A, a, a spondylolisthesis? <laughs> a spondylolisthesis is when the spine is out of uh, out of alignment. It was kind of like our friend Michael, he had a spondylolisthesis and made him not a candidate for an artificial disc. So for people with spondylolisthesis in the lumbar spine, they're, they're really better off than just getting it fused. For folks in the neck, if their spondylolisthesis is less than three millimeters, and we'll measure it out on flexion exercise and x-rays, they're a candidate for an artificial disc. For a, a stimulator, again, this is a totally different mechanism. We're just blocking the pain before it gets to the brain. Um, but we can't correct the spinal diseases. Either you're too healthy or somebody's tried to and failed. It doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. Good, very good question. So a cyst that's pushing on the nerves usually comes from the disc. I see this all the time. Um, there's three options. You could try in putting a needle in the cyst and pulling the fluid out. That's called an aspiration. We always try that first. That's done by usually a pain doctor. Um, Dr. Rob or Dr. Nurki might try that. If that doesn't work, we could try removing the cyst. The, the risk of it coming back is about 20 to 30% that it comes back. So I cut out the cyst and I can do that without a fusion. And there's a 20 to 30% chance that it comes back. And then we have to do a fusion. Some folks are, you know, I don't like those odds. I don't like 20, 30% odds. I just want a fusion and I'll do a fusion right up front. So the answer is there is a risk is about 20 to 30% that it comes back if we, if we cut it out. Now, geez, uh, you asked me a question earlier about the appro approach and the risk of the anterior approach. Did that video help a little bit? Okay. The, so there is an artificial disc that you can put in from the back. It's not FDA approved in the United States. You can go to the Philippines or the Cayman Islands. Um, good luck if you do that. But it's not FDA approved, I don't do that. I don't do procedures that are not FDA approved, okay? Um, maybe one day it would be and I'll, and I'll investigate it and I'll decide if I wanna adopt it. I don't do every procedure in neurosurgery. Um, I kind of try to focus on the ones that I think I'm really good at, but you can get it if you leave the United States. But I don't think any good doctor in the United States would do that operation. Um, you can go to the Philippines and, and, it, and it might work for you. L yeah, let me know how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> we, have we have a lot of people online. Okay, so that's the difference between uh, modulating the nerve with electricity. So spinal cord stimulation, you can turn it off. You can turn it on and off, and it, and it changes the way the nerve behaves. In ablation, well, what does ablation mean? It means destroying the nerve. We try to destroy the nerve either with heat, sometimes you can do it with chemicals, but that's in a, a rhizotomy or ablation. Um, most nerves in the body grow back with an ablation. Some nerves do not. So, I mean, don't try this in the brain or the spinal cord because those nerves are not coming back. But peripheral nerves will often regenerate. So an ablation often needs to be repeated at six to nine months or after a year. It's destroying the nerve. Um, a um, stimulator just modulates or changes, it changes the nerve and affects the way it behaves with electricity. Our program. 
Very interesting question. Very controversial topic. Okay. So um, the, F the FDA requires, so the Food and Drug Administration, and that helps kind of guide a little bit of what we do in medicine. We don't always follow the FDA, but most times we do. So there has to be minimal manipulation of any stem cells. So we can't reprogram them. We can spin them down, but we can ma manipulate them minimally. Most authorities believe that if you minimally manipulate the stem cells, spin them down, but you're not reprogramming them with something called CRISPR or, or changing any aspect of the stem cells, they do not regenerate, regenerate the disc. In some folks, anecdotally, anecdotally is just a story, it does help, but it doesn't regenerate the disc. And most people don't believe that it regenerates the disc. There is experimental study, which is not FDA approved, experimental, where we take stem cells from a donor, reprogram the cells to go into another person. Now we need to study this to make sure it doesn't cause a cancer, all right, and that it actually works. And so um, we're, when I say we, I, think, I say my colleagues are working on totally regenerating this, but it's not available today in the United States. You might want to go with my friend to the Philippines and see if it works there, okay? But not today in the United States. They don't regenerate the cells. We do think anecdotally it improves pain, but right now we can only minimally manipulate the cells. We can't reprogram them. It can, but so, but, but so can sugar water. You know, if I, or, or, um, or black tar, whatever we can, we can improve the height of the disc and, but like, is that durable? Will that last? Is that healthy and safe? The accepted method is to put in an artificial disc, which is not a real disc. It's artificial, um, to re restore the height, or you can do a fusion to put in a spacer and restore the height, but the height risk restoration is important in recovery. We do know that. So we're working on it. Check out my update next year, and I'll tell you where we're at. Wait, wait, we have a question in the room. I want a question in the room. Yeah. Does the threshold for spinal cord stimulators increase with utilization over time? Similar to when deep brain stimulators are utilized? Yeah. So absolutely. So so that is that is one hundred percent true. So the brain, as we block the signals, you know, to to the brain. The, the brain gets smarter and you get what's called tachyphylaxis and it, it no longer provides the same benefit. And so what we have to do, and I encourage all my patients is to get a, well, I call it a tuna, but it's a reprogramming of the simulator. There's over a hundred thousand different combinations of programs to reprogram the simulator when you get used to it. So if you think of your favorite food, I love pizza, my wife loves pizza, but if I had pizza every single night, it's not the same. You know, it, my brain starts to get used to it. The anticipation of the pizza, the, the melted cheese, the pepperoni, it doesn't taste as good. So I got to change it up, you know, change the toppings or eat something different. And that is how we kind of combat that tachyphylaxis. But there is a, 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 a syndrome where it works great. And then six months later, it stops working as well. What I recommend is changing the program either a lot or a little, and there's a hundred thousand different programs. And you can go, if I had a hundred thousand different foods, I could eat the rest of my life and still be happy. You know, I probably eat about 50 different foods, you know, but if you can reprogram it, you can kind of combat that tachyphylaxis that it can happen. But that's a really insightful patient. And it happens in other types of neurostimulation like Parkinson's disease. They're constantly having to reprogram the device to get the same benefit. So you, so you mean like stem cells? Oh, so I'll answer both questions. So. Actually, let me How about disc replacement surgery? So what if the patient has disc replacement So the ideal candidate, and I we just wrote the paper, I don't have the paper up, but it just got published. The ideal candidate has had pain for greater than six months, skeletally mature. So we don't do this on kids, okay? Skeletally mature, without osteoporosis, T-score um, less than 1.5, has failed conservative management, has tried injection physical therapy, tried other things, 
So if you just show up after a football game and say you want artificial this, I won't do it. Okay, you need to fail other things. And then we, and then furthermore, we know, we notice that people that are not on narcotics before surgery do better. People that have loss of disc height, so will really collapse tend to do better. Um, we did we did not notice a, a difference in obesity or heavy lifting jobs. That didn't matter, but free of narcotics and loss of disc height, because then when we restore the disc height, most people notice an improvement. So th those are the, the criteria. Now, some of you might come to my office and say, hey, I'm on a lot of narcotics and I want to have the surgery. And I said, yeah, I think you need it based on the x-rays, you're a good candidate. But I might tell you that you need to get off of the narcotics before the surgery. And that disappoints a lot of people. Like, wait a minute, I need my pill. But I know that if you're on narcotics going into it, that your outcome is not going to be good as good after it. And it's not that I don't want to prescribe the medication, but I, that medication doesn't decrease my, the effectiveness of my surgery. So I'll try to get people off of it. And we've done that before. It's not easy sometimes. We'll get people off of narcotics, we do the operation, give them a short course of narcotics after surgery. And I believe in narcotics at very short, ideally one or two weeks at the most four to six weeks. Because I don't want I don't I don't want to get people hooked on them. They're addictive. They're addictive, and it's a big problem. We were talking a lot about the opiate crisis before COVID, but it's a huge problem. It ruins lots of lives, um, increases their costs in law enforcement. A lot of crime is tied to it. So um, I, I just don't want to be the person getting you hooked on the drugs because eventually you're I'm going to say no, and then you're going to have to get your drugs elsewhere, and that might be Colfax Avenue. That might it's cheaper to get heroin to inject in your arm. So I, I just don't even go there. I don't want to go there. So it, it doesn't really work that well for arthritis. It doesn't work for nociceptive pain. It doesn't work for mechanical pain. It works for a toothache. It works for more um, neuropathic pain. And I'd say that I probably would not recommend a stimulator for arthritis. I might recommend cleaning out the arthritis with a laminectomy, either awake or asleep, an artificial disc sometimes, or even a fusion, but not for arthritis, not for arthritis. And I think one last question we had was, uh, how long should you wait to get attention to the disc? So um, it, it, I, guess, it, I guess it depends. If you have weak discs right away, like yesterday, if you have bowel or bladder incontinence, head to the ER, don't finish the end of the question. You know, incontinence can be permanent, you know, if it's not treated right away. So weakness or incontinence right away, if it's just pain and you can deal with it, you know, I would, I would give it like a week maybe, you know, before getting an injection or therapy. If it lasts more than six weeks, with just pain, I'd recommend surgery. But you gotta understand like the way it works, some people come to my office, okay, let's do the operation. I don't do it the same day, okay? It requires, uh, I, have, I have somebody here kind of laugh, but I think she went in their operation the same day. I was like, no, we got to get it scheduled. We got to, you know, so I'd say if you're, if your symptoms are not get, getting better after a few weeks and it's just pain, I, I would see a doctor and I, and I would operate after six weeks. Yes, sir. Yeah, so bulging is more controversial because if you don't have leg pain, I tend to let it be because bulging discs to me is like gray hair. Everybody will get bulging discs. Sometimes it can be painful, but usually I'll try to get you through it with physical therapy um, or, or non-narcotic medications like, you know, Motrin, Tylenol for bulging discs. If you have leg pain, I, uh, it's a judgment call. I might I might try to trim it down a little bit to free up the nerve. But if you just have back, back pain, I usually try not to operate on bulging discs because if I did that, if I operated on all every bulging disc I'd see, I'd be operating on everybody in the room. I, th I think everybody in this room, if we got an MRI, they have a bulging disc. A disc herniation, extrusion, different story, bigger bigger deal. But bulging discs can be painful. You know, I don't underestimate how much pain they can be, but the surgery is less effective for bulging discs. Sir? Have you ever done, have you ever done multiple disc replacement four, five, five, six, and then seven? In the United States? 
Yeah, so I've done up to two level artificial disc. Um, and that's FDA approved up to two levels. I've never done three. Have other people done three? Yes. Have people done four? Yes. But that usually is in other uh, countries, you know? And I, and, um, I try to be uh, an innovator, but I still operate inside of the rules of the game, which is the FDA, okay? So you can think of like um, a, a football game and it's got rules, you know, there's a boundary, okay? And when you cross a boundary, you're operating outside of the FDA. So I try to do everything I can on that playing field inside of the rules and up to two level is the current indication, but I've never done three. Uh, I've seen other doctors do uh, four or, or, or three and they say it works great, but I don't do it myself. I can get you a plane ticket to France. That's where they do it, France and Germany, three, four levels. What, uh, what, what are the, but most problems are usually one, are usually one level, you know? It's unusual that it's like four levels. I mean, that's a really bad, unlucky patient that has four levels that are all causing the problems. Usually if I can get to one, sometimes two, that does the vast majority of the patients. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, yeah. Uh, what is the previous sign device? The Prima? The Prima. Yes. Got me stumped. I'll, I'll, I'll have to t talk about it next year. Uh, I'm not aware of the Prima spine device. If, if I knew what it did, I, I might be able to comment a little bit more. But the Prima, I'm not sure of that company. I've never used it. Sorry. Next question. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, the tops? Oh, the tops? I know the tops. Okay, I call it the tops. TOPS. That is a cassette replacement system. It's currently in FDA trials. Um, if I gave this talk yet last year, I'd say you could only get it in the Philippines or the Cayman Islands but we're currently trialing it in the United States. What it involves is a motion preservation device. And this talk was all FDA stuff, but this is, uh, this is currently in study. I think it will be approved in the next one to two years by the FDA. You may not have known this, but the FDA is working on other stuff like COVID vaccines, but they're gonna get to this. What it involves is removing the facet joints, decompressing the spine, and then putting it in, in an actuator with screws that go in the back, okay, of the spine, and it preserves motion. And the study right now is up to two years. My worry is not the the, the facet replacement, it's the screws. Because when I do a fusion, I know that the, if, if the patient doesn't fuse, the screws get loose. They can loosen, and that loosening happens after, after about one or two years if it doesn't fuse. I'm actually doing a research study to try to speed up that fusion with different types of uh, medications one is BNP, bone morphogenic protein. We're seeing that it pre increases the fusion rate. But my, my worry is you get this device, you feel good for two years, and the screws are gonna fail, I think, eventually, and then you're gonna, you're, then where do you go? Then you're gonna need a fusion. But it's under investigation. I don't do the surgery. I'm not in the trial. I don't know if I will do the surgery, but again, I don't necessarily wanna be the first one to do it in Vail, Colorado, get my name in the paper. I wanna see if it's working on and other centers before I consider trying it. But that's the TOPS procedure. It's a facet replacement device currently in trials in the United States, not yet FDA approved. That's all I know about that. Wow. Well, I think we, what time is it? What is it? Uh, an hour, 7.30 yet? No, 6.30. So um, this is our first event. I'm so excited to see like faces in the room. Normally I do these events and I would not do them online. Now we're doing a hybrid model where it's online and in person. I think we had a, over 200 people sign up online. We have a packed house in person. It's so good to see um, uh, past patients, maybe future patients. I'm here for you. I'm going to try to do less but better surgery on you uh, if I can. Not everybody's a candidate for every single approach, but it's not one size fits all. You know, we, we approach each case differently. I want to thank I have two PAs I, that could stand up, please. <laughs> Laura and Holly, and uh, they are my, my secret weapon. More important than any device that I used the people I work with. Okay. And then my office manager, does she run away? Where's Lori? Oh, she's in the back. She's like, she's making sure everything gets done. Yeah, please. 
Yeah, I know where it's going. <laughs> so, um, okay. So there. Are, um, so first of all, I'll say there are very good orthopedic surgeons that can do spine. There are very good neurosurgeons, which I'm a neurosurgeon that, that also do spine. Our training starts at different places, and it kind of ends up in the same place. Neurosurgeons are really concerned with the musculoskeletal system, okay? The first, first orthopedic surgeon, it means a uh, straight child. They, they took care of pediatric scoliosis. They're, they're, they're the guys that usually do shoulder replacements, hip and knee replacements, long bone fractures, uh, the axial skeleton, okay? Some orthopedic surgeons get an additional one year of training to become uh, 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 specialized in the spine. And then they do a lot of similar operations that I do. They, they can do spine fusions, artificial discs, everything we talked about an orthopedic surgeon can do, um, but they're coming at it from a different approach. What most orthopedic surgeons don't do are uh, tumors. So, so opening up the, the skin around the spinal cord and taking out tumors. What some neurosurgeons don't do are complex, long segment deformity scoliosis operations. And I don't do scoliosis surgery. Um, I, I kind of try to make it simple. And I, and I say that, uh, the orthopedic surgeons are the carpenters, and the neurosurgeons are the electricians. But we, we have an overlap where we do the same operations. And, and, I, and I really do think there's a lot of um, good orthopedic surgeons that do spine surgery. And nobody's been able to prove in a study that a neurosurgeon is better than an orthopedic surgeon. The only study that they have shown is when a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic surgeon work together, the outcomes are even better. So I, I, I do like working with my, my colleagues in orthopedic surgery. I sometimes work with them. I have a lot of partners that I work with uh, as well. But um, uh, it's just two ways to do it. But like, if, if you think about it, you know, um, a oral maxillofacial surgeon, like a dentist who's got additional training, can do jaw surgery and do a lot of craniofacial surgery. They can even do a nose job. So can a plastic surgeon. So can an ear, nose, and throat trip, a surgeon, an ENT, also do operate in the same area. So there's some overlap. There's some things that, you know, I, I wouldn't do. I probably wouldn't do a complex pediatric idiopathic deformity operation, scoliosis, um, not unless I had additional training. And most orthopedic surgeons don't really work at the cranial cervical junction where, you know, where they're going to be involved in working on the brain as well. And they're probably not going to take out brain tumors, but there's a lot of overlap. They can do a micro disc. They can do, um, you know, fusion or artificial disc. And some of them are very, very good. So that's that's kind of where I don't try to plant a flag. I mean, obviously, I'm proud to be a neurosurgeon. We, we had seven years of training. I got to do brain tumors, uh, you know, craniofacial trauma. I was, you know, gunshot wounds that had. I did all that stuff, and I do think that it added to my experience. And I and now I specialize in mental basis is fine, but um, uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons, they have a different background. You know, they, they have more, um, experience with, um, the biologics of healing, you know, in terms of fractures, they do, you know, arm, hand, wrist and ankle things. And that's what I, I said earlier. I don't do windows and I also don't do hips. hips. I just focus on the spine and we do some creative work too. Does that answer your question without offending anybody out there? <laughs> All right. Well, folks, thanks so much for, you know, taking time away from whatever else you're going to do, being with your family and relaxing and hearing a little bit about an update. I want to make this a regular thing and try to do it at least once a year to kind of give you any updates. Some of it will be similar. Some of it will be new. Maybe we'll have a TOPS procedure in the new one. There's a new procedure that we started doing called the Intercept Procedure. I, I plan to include that in my next talk. And we'll go from there. We'll see with the five-year data, the seven-year data. Now maybe next year we'll have the, the uh, eight-year data. Okay. Thank Thanks so much.